Um, I dreamt last night that my uh, my blood could cure coronavirus, and uh, and I was going to save the world, and uh, and then I was thinking, uh, hang on a minute. In my dream, those uh, big pharmaceutical companies are going to make a fortune out of me. And I thought uh, maybe I, maybe I should charge a, a quid a shot, you know, a quid a vaccine. You know, it sounded fair. And uh, I was thinking, you know, there's seven billion people in the world, so a conservative estimate say four billion of them had the vaccine. That would be four billion pounds for me, uh, millions of lives saved and trillions of pounds in lost revenue saved. And I thought that sounds like a good deal. But, uh, but there was like a, a big social media campaign started against me and uh, people were saying that uh, I was being greedy and that uh, I shouldn't use me gift for profit and that it was me duty to save the world and, and however much I protested me innocence and tried to say how much more everybody else was making you know it just got worse and worse all the uh, the vitriol and the hatred and uh, and in the end uh, I got kidnapped and they chopped off my arms and my legs and my head and drained every last drop of blood out of my body so what started off as a as a as a hero sort of rich dream ended up as a, a fucking decapitation nightmare you know and then I was just thinking, if I'd had that dream in the 90s, none of that would have happened because there wasn't any Facebook or any uh, Twitter or any of that. None of that relentless barrage of shit reel. And I was thinking I probably would have done it for 4 million quid, not 4 billion then as well. And that made us think how, how ridiculously ramped up our expectations are now. You know what, we're fed this these inc incredible lifestyles and outrageous materialistic goals and we're fed them every minute of every day and every single one of them is unobtainable. You know, I wonder why poor mental health has, has exploded exponentially. You know, I know we're a lot better now about that kind of thing and that um, we're better at talking about it and and I understand that that obviously in, in 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 that scenario some voices might get lost in the crowd, but now there's still a lot of people that suffer in silence, you know. A lot of people that really suffer in silence. Like you. You always suffer in silence. You know, I remember when you were a kid and uh, Auntie Maggie had split up with Uncle Darren for the first time. She was staying at ours and we were sat in the dining room and she was talking shit about Darren's toenails and his bloody snore. And, and I looked out the window and you were on your swing, but you weren't, you weren't swinging, you know, you were just sat there just hovering. Just looking at your shoes and uh, you looked so incredibly lonely, man. You looked so alone. I should have just told Auntie Maggie to fuck off. Run out there and cuddle the shit out of you, but, uh, but I didn't. I know I did. And I regret that now. Obviously, we got that more than ever. I was reading a, reading an article online the other day about um, the Golden Gate Bridge and and people jumping off to kill themselves. And, uh, and it's like three thousand people have jumped off, but only like thirty people have ever survived. And all of those 30 people all said the same thing. That the moment they let go, they regretted it, you know. That in that instance, they realised that 
everything apart from what they had just done. Everything in their life was fixable. And I wondered if they all thought that. If they all regretted it. I know you didn't regret it. You walk into the sea, you know. You had all the time in the world to change your mind. And I've got these three images in my head, these three things that I just can't get rid of. And the first one is, um, do you want to swing when you were little? I've been so lonely. And then there's that poor lass at our front door with that massive dog shaking like a leaf. James's dad, she called us. James's dad, you gotta come quick. James has just walked into the sea with his clothes on. No. Oh. I knew. I knew straight away, but I uh, asked her to repeat herself. Wanted to give her a chance to say she'd got it wrong. You know, or I'd heard it wrong, but you said it again. James has walked into the sea with his clothes on and we're going to find them. That's the second thing anyway. The third thing is, is you walking into the sea, you know? I'm not watching you. Uh, I am you, you know. I, I, I can feel everything, the pain and the suffering and the loneliness. And I can feel all of that, the relief as it all washes away. You know. No matter how many people love cheer or how many people you loved, or how many people you had around you, you know. I know now that you were out, it's going to be lonely. And so I'm not angry, son, you know. Just wanted to let you know that. I mean, I was. At first, I was fucking livid. <laughs> For those three things, you know, they just... Uh, they just help us understand. Your mum's still angry. Jesus. She's angry with you. She's angry with the world, but most of all, she's angry with herself. And I don't think there's anything I can do to change that. She'll just have to work it out. Eh? I'm not sure she will. And you know what the worst thing is? The worst thing is it's not definite, you know. Until we find you, there's always hope. Hope that it wasn't you, that you changed your mind, that, I don't know, yeah, living in a squat somewhere, full of drugs and talking shite, and you're just gonna walk back in the front door and say that you found yourself and it's all gonna be all right. the worst kind of hope you know because it's a false hope and that hurts I know there's no good way to do what you did but if you jumped off a bridge or threw yourself in front of a train at least I would know you know Well, that's just me being selfish. Yeah. So I just wanted you to know that I'm not angry. But I am in pain. <laughs> oh, it's so much pain, mate. I miss you so much. And I don't mean inside, I mean like a real actual pain. 
Sometimes it's so bad I think I'm having a heart attack and I think, good, at least it'll be over and done with. I slept in your bed last night. What good's that gonna do us? I've been off at counselling, but uh, nah, it's not for me. I'm just gonna suffer in silence, like you did, just to spite you, you little prick. <laughs> But we know you're not going to come back. We know you're not going to walk in that door. It doesn't stop us talking about it. What would we do? I grab a hold of you and squeeze you and never let you go. You know, I'm going to hold on to that false hope. I am. I've got to keep tight a hold of it because it's what gets me through the day. And I'm going to remember your face and I'm going to look at pictures of you every day because if I can see your face, then you haven't left us. You're still with us. Found you. 